Welcome to A Perfect Touch. I'm Jeanette. First, there was an inspiration. A 1996 Hallmark Holiday Homecoming Collector Series Holiday Traditions Barbie. As the cover says, quote, Arriving home for the holidays dressed in her finest traveling attire, featuring a plum-colored jacket over a full skirt and a velvety wide-brimmed hat embellished with a glamorous feather, unquote. Hoping to travel to visit friends for the holidays, I created a plan to bring the Victorian Barbie to life. Then I made the velvety wide-brimmed hat embellished with a glamorous feather. Next, the full skirt. I'll share links to the blog posts and videos for the plan, the hat, and the skirt. And now for the last piece to bring a Victorian Barbie to life, the plum-colored jacket. I'll be using the same silk velvet I used for the hat and the mauve satin I used for the underlayer of the skirt. The pattern is a bit different than the jacket our Barbie wears. Her jacket has the large, puffed, leg of mutton sleeve with a straight hem and center back closing. I'll be using a pattern I've used before with a wide sleeve, scalloped hem, stand up or fold down scalloped collar, and double breasted front closing. The pattern is Wearing History 1007 Sophie, 1899 French jacket in bust sizes from 30 to 46. I originally purchased this pattern in PDF format. On the Wearing History blog are links to several tutorials with specifics on creating the collar and the link to a vlog about this pattern. The Sophie pattern was taken from an original historic pattern from La Mode Illustre, an example shown here, which were a work of chaotic art. The Wearing History pattern has had seam allowances, markings, and detailed instructions added. When I first made a jacket from this pattern, I made a mock-up. For the collar and cuffs, I used a matelassé fabric and carefully positioned the fabric design for each collar piece. I had three vintage embellishments and hand-stitched them to the back and sleeves of the jacket. The finished jacket was a wonderful piece with the matelassé fabric skirt, which also had another coordinating jacket and a ball gown bodice. But there is a new problem. The silk velvet of today does not behave like the silk velvets of 1899. Modern silk velvet can be very flimsy, drapey, and even see-through. And my velvet, while the perfect color, is all of that. So I set out to learn about modern silk velvet from every source I could find. Very helpful was an article by Seamwork. An article by Threads Magazine and a workshop in Foundations Revealed, an online resource with membership options. I'll share all links in the description. I learned that my modern silk velvet may behave differently with the addition of fusible interfacing. I test a piece of interfacing I have on hand to ensure that the process works with my fabric. The result is very promising. As recommended by the Foundations Revealed mentor during the workshop, research and training, I am using a Pellon Specialty Apparel Interfacing SF101 Shape Flex Fusible with a 100% woven cotton base. I purchased my fusible interfacing and proceeded to test again. The SF101 can be pre-washed for shrinkage prior to using, but I decide that since my jacket will not be washed, I will test how much shrinkage happens when fusing. I cut several small pieces from both the velvet and interfacing, fused them using a velva board and damp press cloth, and no actual pressure from the iron. After cooling, I check the adhesion, shrinkage, and drape of the velvet. I'm thrilled. This test is a success. Since there is no shrinkage of the interfacing, I decide to cut my interfacing first from the pattern pieces. And here are all 37 pieces cut from the interfacing. I take care to cut the interfacing correctly for the glue side and the non-glue side. Then I lay the interfacing piece glue side to the wrong side of the fabric following the required grain line. 
The interfacing is pinned to the velvet. Each piece is roughly cut from the velvet, and I now have 37 pattern pieces to fuse. I begin fusing the smaller pieces with the velvet board, the damp press cloth, and the iron. The velvet is laid face down on the velvet board, the press cloth sprayed with water, and the heated iron held over an area for 15 seconds. The iron is held close to the press cloth, but there is no pressure from the iron. I smooth the interfacing to the fabric by hand to ensure adhesion of the melted glue. After the piece has cooled in place, I check for full adhesion and repeat the process if and where necessary. Then I can cut away the excess velvet and the piece is now ready for sewing. A note here, this fusible interfacing is also safe for the sewing machine. To handle the larger pieces, I cover my ironing board with a piece of velvet. Since there is no pressure from the iron, there is no damage to the pile of the velvet being fused or the velvet on the ironing board. I keep my pattern pieces pinned to the fabric piece to keep everything organized until needed. Here are the facing pieces ready for sewing. Here are the sleeve pieces ready for sewing and the main body pieces ready for sewing. Pattern markings transferred using a chalk pencil. And with a beautifully handling silk velvet, all 37 pieces are now ready to create the 1899 Sophie French jacket. A beautifully coordinating color thread that was ordered online. And as with every new project, a new needle. I've covered my pressing ham with velvet to avoid crushing the pile when pressing the sewn seam. I'm also very careful to use only the tip of the iron to press the seam open, and I do that from the inside only. I'm generous with my clipping and notching to allow the curves to fall gently in place. This is a photo before I join the fronts and back, so that you can see the upper dart on the fronts and the seams for the fronts and back. The jacket has a lot of curve built into the pattern, and it is a lovely silhouette. The jacket can be constructed with or without a full lining. Since I will be wearing this as a jacket over a blouse, I decide to use a full lining of the same satin as the underlayer of the skirt. I cut all pattern pieces from the mid-weight satin. I begin by pinning the center back. When I'm sewing with velvet, I'm very generous with pinning. I find it helps keep the velvet from moving around and it slows my sewing because I remove the pins as I sew. I staged this photo for you to show the difference in my pinning of the center back of the velvet outer layer and the satin inner layer. The lining fronts and back are sewn, clipped, notched, and seams pressed. The back facing hem allowance is turned under one half inch, and then the facing is sewn to the back lining all the way around. The lining sides are sewn together and the main body lining is ready. The outer sides are sewn together and are also ready. Time to assemble the collar. I have taken a short course in collar prep during a costume on virtual weekend. I review my instructions and materials. I have a very lightweight but supportive apparel non-fusible interfacing, an Italian linen lightweight canvas interlining, and a 3 16 cotton edge tape. I want my collar to be softly standing and I test a sample of my two options. I decide to add the non-fusible light interfacing to what will be the underside of the collar. It will provide a bit more support, but will not require pad stitching, which will be visible on the velvet. And I don't want that to show if the collar is worn up or down. I cut the interfacing directly from the pattern pieces and will sew it in with the seams. I sew the collar pieces together for both the upper and under collar sections, just to the beginning of the curve as indicated on the pattern pieces. Seam stitching is pressed and then pressed open. The upper and under collars are placed right sides together. 
The seam allowances are pinned out of the way to expose the full curve of a section. The curve is sewn from one side to another and along the entire outside edge of the end pieces as shown here. When the collar is later turned right side out, there will be a gentle scalloped edge. Repeat the process for all sections of the collar. Pin the seam allowances away from the section you will sew. Begin sewing from the stitching made by the straight seam, follow the curve, and end at the stitching made by the straight seam on the other side of the curve. To help me create the curve stitching, I mark the seam allowance with a chalk pencil and follow that mark. Then I pressed the stitching, graded the seam allowances, and clipped and notched until I had a smooth outer edge to the collar. The collar is turned and the lower edge basted inside the seam allowance. The lapels of the jacket front also follow the scallop design. I line the area to the roll line with the lightweight interfacing and pad stitch. The underside of the lapel will not show and I'm not concerned about the stitches showing, but I decide not to stitch the tailor's edge tape at the roll line as I do not need a crisp turn. The hem facing is also scalloped and carefully assembled, ensuring that the pieces exactly match the jacket lower edge. As with the collar pieces, each piece is sewn to the next, only to the mark. Bias tape is sewn to the upper, unscalloped edge of the facing. The hem facing is then positioned to the lower edge of the jacket, right sides together. The scallops are sewn in the same way as they were sewn on the collar. The seam is pressed at the stitching, and the seam allowance graded, clipped, and notched. The facing is turned right side out. There were some scallops where my stitching was not correct to allow the space between scallops to lay smoothly. In those areas, I clipped my stitches and corrected the problems with hand sewing. It's true that it is very detailed work. But those details are what make this jacket so very special. While I'm in the mood for sewing curves and clipping and notching, I decide to sew the sleeve cuffs. The cuff is simply two pieces sewn right sides together and the seam allowance stitching pressed, then graded, clipped, notched, and turned. I base the inner edge of the cuffs and clip generously in preparation for attaching to the sleeve. As I mentioned before, the sleeves are not the large, puffed, Lego mutton sleeves. The fullness at the shoulder is created by five darts on each upper sleeve and sleeve supports. The dart markings are transferred from the pattern and sewn. The under sleeve is sewn to the upper sleeve and the seam stitches pressed and clipped. The cuff is pinned to the sleeve and sewn. And repeat. The five darts are marked on the satin lining, pinned, and sewn. The inner sleeve seams are sewn and finished. The linings are slipped into the velvet sleeves. The seam allowance is turned at the wrist and hand sewn over the stitching where the cuff was sewn to the sleeve. The linings and velvet sleeves are aligned and basted between the darts at the underarm. Two rows of gathering stitches are sewn between the darts at the upper arm. Up to this point, the main body and body lining for the jacket are ready. The collar is complete. The hem facing is attached. The sleeves are lined and ready. It's almost time to put the jacket together. I know I don't often show you a lot of video of the process, only because I need photographs to put on my blog as well. But here's some video I took for you.
The sleeves are pinned and the gathers are adjusted as necessary. Then both sleeves are sewn to the jacket body. The collar is pinned and sewn. The lining is pinned to the outer body, transferring the sewing and cutting marks for the collar notch. The lining is sewn and the seam allowance stitching pressed. The seam is then graded, clipped, notched, and the entire lining and jacket body turned right side out. I had considered boning the four back seams with spiral boning. Some experimenting showed not much difference with the interfaced velvet, and I decided not to bone the jacket. But if I change my mind in the future, it will be simple to release the lining hem and add boning. The seam allowance is turned under at the armhole opening and covers the sleeve stitching. Then it is hand stitched in place. The lining at the hem facing is also turned under and hand stitched to the bias tape at the top of the facing. Now it's time for the closures on this double breasted jacket. The illustration and instructions show two rows of five buttons each. Originally I had planned to cover button blanks with the velvet. Then one day I was scrolling through available buttons on eBay and there they were, the perfect touch, a large handmade beaded button with an eight pointed star center surrounded by jet black seed beads. The seller is The Pink Caravan on eBay, located in Pennsylvania and offering free shipping and a discount for my multiple order of three buttons. I will need 10 and I order 12 to have that extra button pinned into the inside of the jacket, ready for any emergency. I practice a machined buttonhole on a fabric scrap. Success! I mark my buttonhole placement according to the pattern and machine the five buttonholes. I place a straight pin at the bar ends of the buttonhole and open the buttonhole with a seam ripper. The pin stops the seam ripper from moving beyond the bar. To relieve stress on the fabric when the jacket is buttoned, I sew the buttons through the shanks and through the holes of a flat button at the back. With one set of buttons sewn in place, I can pin the other row and check for alignment. Then the second set of non-working buttons are sewn on the jacket. The last item the jacket needs are the sleeve supports. I draft a pattern according to the instructions and cut two buckram and two fabric pieces. The buckram and fabric are folded in half and machine stitched following the curve, the edges covered with bias tape. The sleeve support is sewn with a straight edge centered at the armhole shoulder seam and tacked to the sleeve fabric. The jacket design is for a wide shoulder the sleeve supports definitely create a beautiful wide line while supporting the interfaced and darted fabric. When not being worn, the sleeve supports can be clipped together at the bias ends to maintain their shape. The 1899 French jacket is complete and ready to wear with the 1898 walking skirt. I love the style and colors. The hat, skirt, and now the jacket are ready for their first outing, but we are still missing the perfect touches that will bring the holiday traditions Barbie to life. First, those fluffy white collar and cuffs. Years ago, I made some stuffed animals in pink and white with a fabric that has soft curly fibers. I still have some of this fabric and I cut three pieces to the length and width I determined would most recreate the Barbie look and sewed the fabric by hand. I added six layers of apparel batting to the centers of each and tacked the batting in place. I sewed the ends closed and added slip clasps anchored with a satin ribbon sewn through all layers.
The last touch is Barbie's heart pin and ribbon. I found a puffed heart necklace at a shop in my state and it felt like a special gift just opening the package. I found a ribbon that was a closer match to the inspiration drawing than what was on the doll and I created a bow. I didn't want to remove the necklace and just made a few stitches through the chain and ribbon and done.